Welcome to the online course on the Nibbana Sermons 12 to 22 by Bhikkhu Katakurunda Nyanananda and e-learning course hosted in collaboration between the Numata Center for Buddhist Studies at the University of Hamburg and the Barra Center for Buddhist Studies in Massachusetts. And today we will be looking at sermon number 16. But before coming to that, again a few extracts from the very rich discussion in the online forum. Yeah, Chris Burke, he quoted uh, someone else. Uh, for suggesting that uh, Bahia uh, was a follower of the Brihadaranika Upanishad. And he mentioned in particular the chapter 3, part 7 and verse 23. So I, I had a look at this uh, Radhakrishnan's uh, principal Upanishad. I found this very interesting to follow it up. So the whole uh, chapter 3 7 as a whole is on this idea that basically vayu the breath is like the atman or the essence that stands behind all things and so he like a thread that keeps everything together the inner controller and so the Chapter goes on saying like uh, this 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 Atman, this inner controller, which is immortal, is in all things. Like it's in the earth, but the earth does not know it. And it's in the four elements. And it's also in the sun, the moon and the stars, which uh, relates to the final verse of the Vaya Sutta, where they are also mentioned. And it's also within darkness and light, in all beings, in the breath, in speech, the eye, ear, nose, tongue, the eye, mind, I'm sorry, the skin. And finally, we get this final verse where uh, it said also he dwells in the semen. The semen does not know it. And then Adrishto drishta, ashrutta shrutta, amata manta, avinyato vinyata. So this this Atman is never seen, but it's the seer. It's never heard, but it's the hearer. It's never perceived, but it's the perceiver. It's never thought, but it's the thinker. And that is your Atman. The, the true self, the inner control, and the immortal Amrita. So if you look at this more closely, then I think the idea of a relevance to the Bhaya sort of diminishes because this Atman is in principle something that is not seen and not heard, etc. So an instruction in the scene, just the scene, or merely what is seen, would not have any relevance to this kind of Atman, because it's anyway, in principle, not something that can be seen. In fact, I had underlined this this part in the when I when I read through the Upanishads, I had underlined this, but afterwards I had not followed up further because it didn't seem to be directly relevant. And when we look at it from the perspective of the Buddhist tradition, the Udana story is uh, basically the main information we have about Bahia, uh, simply because he meets the Buddha and right away afterwards he passes away. So he also occurs in the uh, list of eminent disciples in Anguttara Nikaya as eminent for Kipabhinya, for we're quickly realizing uh, penetrative understanding and realization. But in the Udana uh, story itself, all the information we get is that he 
was very uh, respected and uh, uh, received ample uh, support in the place where he was living and was considered an Arahant. He also considered himself an Arahant. And then a deva came and told him, you're not an Arahant. And, and then he goes off over to see the Buddha. And so this doesn't say anything about his type of practice. Now, if we look at the commentary, according to the commentary on the Udana, uh, Bhaiya had actually been a disciple of the previous Buddha Kasapa. And at that time, he already perfected his uh, training in morality and concentration, but he did not have a breakthrough. And uh, the Udana commentary links him also to others, that is Kumara Kasapa, Pukusati, and uh, Dabba Malaputta, for example. It sees all of these monks who at the time of the Buddha uh, very quickly got realization as having been monks at the time of the Buddha Kasapa, and they are kind of done their, their preliminary training, if we may call it such. <clears throat> and according to the Udana commentary, um, in this present life, Bai had been a merchant and he had been uh, doing several successful voyages by ship to trade. But on the last voyage, he won, he went shipwreck. And that is how he ended up in Superanta, the area of modern Bombay. He was, uh, he just, he just survived, but he was nude. And so he picked up uh, some, uh, he is called Daruchiri, a bark garment. He picked up some bark or wood from that ship to clothe himself. And people saw him like that and thought that that was a very impressive uh, practice of wearing this kind of clothes and offered him food and support. And he was so uh, conscientious that he said, well, if people are supporting me, uh, then I should really also practice very seriously. And so he maintained an excellent conduct and that earned him an even better reputation. And people were starting to say that he must be an Arahant and he himself eventually believed that. So from the viewpoint of the Udana commentary, uh, uh, there's no reference at all to any kind of teach or teaching he followed. Uh, he would just have been naturally picking up the type of practice that he already learned under Kasapa Buddha, the practice of morality and maybe also some meditation. We don't, we don't know exactly. So from that viewpoint, there is, I think, no, no place to uh, associate him with uh, Upanishadic teachings and to see him as a follower of any Upanishads, Briyad uh, Aranika or any other Upanishad. <coughs> And uh, further support uh, for this position would also be the fact that the same instruction in the scene, just the scene, is given to Malunkya Buddha in the Samyutta Nikaya. And Malunkya Buddha was a Buddhist monk, and by the time of getting that instruction, he was already a monk for quite some time. He's the one well known for his earlier speculation about the undeclared points where he even threatens to disrupt if the Buddha doesn't reply. This again is something that is not part of the Upanishadic tradition, but more belongs, seems to belong to a different strand of ancient Indian religious practices. And finally, uh, the uh, ending verse of the Bahya Sutta is addressed by the Buddha to the other monks who have just cremated Bahya. And so there is also no need or no any reason for the Buddha to refer to any kind of Upanishadic teachings that would just not be relevant for that context. So I thought it was very interesting for this to be brought up, but on further examination, I find it improbable that the Brihadaranika Upanishad has any particular relevance to the Bahya Sutta. And I would just be interested to know who has made that statement that uh, Bhaiya is a follower of the Brihadaranika Nika Upanishad. Because in all my reading, I have never come across this very interesting idea, but uh, I, I think probably not 
uh, convincing. Then there was a comment by Letizia Baglioni. I hear Venable Anario's comment not as adversarial to Venable Nyanananda's understanding, but as a timely instance of such a truth, truthfulness, or a question of giving evidence that runs parallel with one's level of experience, to quote the Venable Katakurunda Nyanananda himself. Venable Nyanananda's main concern is to address and deconstruct a probably widespread notion leading to reification of Nibbana as an actual place, based on a commentary reading of the passage. Moreover, to show the importance of the underestimated instruction to buy as a template for the whole threefold higher training. So the literalism and the emphasis on the luminosity of mind strike me as secondary to his main point and his quite palpable concern to turn his audience's mind back onto itself and away from notions of a mysterious goal out there. Once this crucial step has been accomplished, we can then appreciate a further clarification of what Nibbana is not, with the help of Venable Analio's suggestion, by hinting at the splendor of the Atman and the darkness of the beginnings of the universe, the Udana verses would poetically and emphatically negate all the expected features and metaphysical implications of any mystical experience. Yeah, I'm very glad that uh, the way Letizia has formulated this, and this is also my own feeling that this uh, thing about the luminosity is not really so central. And that the main point of Anamanyananda's understanding very clearly stands as it is. And so it's just a minor uh, disagreement that I articulated and I tried to articulate it with a lot of respect uh, in the last sermon. And I'm glad that that, that came over, that I'm not just like uh, playing the part of the one who knows it all so much better, but just giving a few times uh, different perspectives that particularly emerge from the a comparative study that is so powerful. And I really th see it as a like a two-step approach for getting at the gist of the teachings. The first one, which has Venerable Nyananda has so beautifully done to help us to step out of that reliance on the commentaries and us here I'm speaking particularly from the viewpoint of Asian Buddhists to appreciate the contributions that the commentaries can make but not to read the early discourse material through the lenses of the commentaries but let it stand on its own and then my own contribution in particular to see the Pali discourses in the light of their parallels which sometimes simply helps to clarify a naughty or obstruse points. There was a comment by Sharla Catherine. The tangle of becoming can be very tightly wound into our interpretations of even simple experiences of seeing and hearing as I or mine, let alone the refined qualities of the meditating mind. So the insightful progress of our practice can become the next arena to see if we are clinging to a subtle way of becoming the meditator or the one who understands things as they are. <coughs> Every place this mind tries to take a stand on, a ground is not found to stand upon. And even the notions of stability and security appear ludicrous. I thought that was very beautiful of bringing that instruction in the scene, just the scene, uh, right into uh, the meditation practice. And at the end she even says, in the letting go, there's just letting go. It's very beautiful. And then there was a comment by Bhikkhu Sangamaji about Vemmanyanananda. Uh, that he said, uh, uh, sometimes said he was a practitioner mistaken for a scholar. And I think such statements clearly express his respect for the practice, for the purpose of Dhamma. Yeah, I have never come across this statement by him and I really appreciate it because that is a little bit also where I 
find myself that uh, I am I would also like to say of myself that I'm actually in spite of all the scholarly work I really would see myself predominantly as a practitioner so that's a beautiful meeting point for me with the venerable Nyanananda so now time to go into sermon number 16 Itang santang itang panitang yadidang sabba sankara samato sabbo padipati nisaggo tanhakanka yogirago nirodo nibbanang. This is peaceful, this is excellent, namely the stilling of all preparations, the relinquishment of all assets, and the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, extinction. With the permission of the most venerable great preceptor, in the assembly of the venerable meditative monks. This is the 16th sermon in the series of sermons on Nibbana. In the course of our discussion of the Bhaya Sutta in our last sermon, we drew attention to the wide gap that exists between the sensory experience of the worldling and that experience the Arahant gets through the eye of wisdom. It is the same gap that obtains between the two terms papancha and nippapancha. In sensory experience, which is based on worldly expressions, worldly usages and worldly concepts, there is a discrimination between a thing to be grasped and the one who grasps, or in other words, a subject-object relationship. There is always a bifurcation, a dichotomy, in the case of sensory perception. If there is a scene, there has to be something seen and the one who sees. That is the logic. In the Bhaya Sutta, beginning with in the scene, there will be just the scene. The Buddha proclaimed to the ascetic Bhaya a brief exhortation on Dhamma, which enables one to transcend the above narrow viewpoint and attain the state of non-proliferation or Nippapancha. There is nothing to see, no one to see, only a scene is there. The cause of all these conceptual proliferations of papancha in the world is contact. The Arans understood this by their insight into the fact that the seen, the heard, the sensed and the cognized are simply so many collocations of conditions which come together for a moment due to contact only to break up and get dispersed the next moment. What is called the seen, the heard and the cognized are for the worldling so many things. But to the wisdom eye of the Arahans they appear as mere conglomerations of conditions dependent on contact, which momentarily come together and then get dispersed. This insight into the dependence on contact, Pasang Paticca, is the very essence of the law of dependent arising, Paticca Samuppada. It is equivalent to seeing the law of dependent arising itself. Comment, yeah, I just found, would like to mention how powerful I find this pointing to contact, which is a very important dimension of uh, dependent arising that is often not fully appreciated and sometimes I myself earlier thought that contact is just kind of like a, you would even dispense with it it's just the coming together of object sense and consciousness and so why why think about it much but if we come to see it in the light of what the Venerable Nyanananda has just seen, said here and basically just pointing to the event of experience as something conditioned, I think this can be very powerful. End of comment. In order to transcend the narrow point of view limited to the basis of sense contact or the six sense spheres, and realize the state of Nibbana indicated by the words Vinyanang Anidasanang Anantang Sambatopavam, consciousness which is non manifestative, endless, lustrous on all sides one has to see the cessation of contact.
In a certain discourse in the Mochalinda Vanga of the Udana, the Buddha has declared in a verse of uplift that the cessation of contact comes about only by doing away with that which brings about contact. The wandering ascetics of other sects grew jealous of the Buddha and his congregation of monks because of their own loss of gain and honor and began to hurl abuse on monks in the village and in the forest. A group of monks came and reported this to the Buddha. The Buddha's response to it was only a pain of joy. Udana actually means a spontaneous utterance of joy, and the verse he uttered was such a one, but it embodied an instruction on Dhamma and a norm of Dhamma as well. Gami aranye sukadukka putto nivattato na parato dahetha pusandipasa upadhin paticca in the first two lines we get an instruction. Touched by pain in village or in forest, think not in terms of oneself or others. The reason for it is given in the norm of Dhamma which follows. Touches can touch one because of assets. How can touches touch him who is asset less? Comment, translation by Ireland. When affected by pleasure and pain in the village and forest, one should not ascribe them to oneself or another. Contacts affect one dependent on clinging. How can contacts affect one without clinging? End of comment. This is all what the Buddha uttered. From this we can glean another aspect of the significance of the terms Sabupadi Patini Sangha, relinquishment of all assets and Nirupadi the assetless, used with reference to Nibbana. In a number of previous sermons, we happen to explain the concept of Upadi to some extent, as and when the term Upadi and Patinis Sangha came up. To refresh our memory, we may summarize all that now. What is the concept of Upadi, or assets, recognized by the world? Whatever that bolsters up the ego. Be it gold, silver, pearls, gems, money, house and property, deposits and assets. All these are reckoned as upadi in general. But when considered from the point of view of Dhamma, upadi in a deeper sense stands for this firefold grasping group, Panchupadana Khandha. Upadana Khandha literally means groups of grasping. Groups of grasping do not necessarily imply that there are material objects to be grasped. But the whirling overcome by that triple proliferation of cravings, conceits and views, and carried away by the worldly conventions, imagines those groups of grasping as things grasped and deposited. The concept of upadi as assets has arisen as a result of this tendency to think of groups of grasping as things grasped and deposited. So it turns out to be a question of viewpoint. Cravings, conceits and views prompt one to look upon all that one has grasped so far and what one hopes to grasp in the future as things one is grasping right now. One thinks of them as things deposited in a safe. The worldlings are holding on to such a mass of assets. Nibbana is the relinquishment of all such assets accumulated in the mind. In order to relinquish these assets, there must be some kind of understanding and enlightenment. The vanity of all these assets has to be seen through by the light of wisdom. It is only by seeing their vanity that the assets are relinquished. In fact, it is not so much a deliberate giving up of assets as a sequential liquidation. In a previous sermon, we gave an illustration of the situation that precipitates relinquishment. Let us bring it up again. We found the cinema quite helpful as an illustration. In explaining the phenomenon of relinquishment of assets, with reference to the cinema, we described how the assets accumulated in the minds of the audience, that is, the assets proper to the cinema world, woven around the story that is filmed, are automatically abandoned when the cinema hall gets lit up. Then one understands the illusory nature of what has been going on. 
It is that understanding, that enlightenment, which precipitates the giving up or relinquishment of assets. To go a step further in this illustration, when lights came on, the sankaras or preparations pertaining to the film show got exposed for what they are. In fact, sankara is a word that has associations with the dramatic tradition in its relation to the acting of actors and actresses down to their makeup which is so artificial and spurious. When the cinema hall gets lit up all of a sudden, one who has been enjoying the film show is momentarily thrown out of the cinema world, because those preparations are pacified or nullified, sabbasankara samato. As a consequence of it, the heap of experiences which he had hitherto regarded as real and genuine loses their sanction. Those assets get liquidated or relinquished, sabu padi padini sangha. In their absence, that craving necessary for the appreciation or enjoyment of the scenes to come becomes extinct, tanhak kayo. When craving is gone, the floridity of the scenes to come also fades away, viraga. With that fading away or decoloration, the film show ceases for the person concerned, nirodha though technically the movie is going on. Because of that cessation, all the fires of defilements proper to the cinema world with which he was burning get extinguished, Nibbana. <clears throat> so here we have the full gamut of the cinema simile as an illustration for Nibbana. This kind of awakening in the cinema world gives us a clue to the fact that the assets, Upadi, are relinquished through an understanding born of enlightenment in the light of wisdom. This, in fact, is something that should be deeply ingrained in our minds. Therefore, we shall endeavor to give some more illustrations to that effect. In our everyday life, too, we sometimes see and hear of instances where assets get relinquished due to understanding. Someone heaps up a huge bundle of currency notes of the highest denomination, deposits it in his safe and keeps watch and ward over it day and night. One fine morning he wakes up to hear that for some reason or other that currency note has been fully devalued by law the previous night. How does he look upon the wads of notes in his safe now? For him it is now a mere heap of papers. The craving conceit and view he had early in regard to the notes are completely gone. The banknotes are no longer valid. He might as well make a bonfire of it. So this is some sort of relinquishment of assets in the world, however temporary it may be. Another person gets a sudden transfer and is getting ready to leave for his new station. His immovable assets he is forced to leave behind, but his movable assets he hurriedly gathers up to take with him. The vehicle has already come and is tooting impatiently, signaling delay. It is well past time, but his preparations are not finished. Time pressed, in hot haste, he is running here and there. At last, when he can delay no longer, he grabs the utmost he can take and darts to the doorstep. Just then he wakes up. It was only a dream. The transfer came in a dream. No real vehicle, no real preparation, only a panting for nothing. So here we have an awakening peculiar to the dream world. This is an instance of letting go of assets connected with the dream. We go through such experiences quite often. Of course, we take it for granted that when we pass from the dream world to the real world, the assets proper to the dream world drop off. But are we sure that in leaving the dream world, we are entering a real world? Is awakening from a dream a true awakening when considered from the view of, view of the Dhamma? Do we actually open our eyes when we awaken from a dream? Comment. Yeah, this is another part of uh, the Venerable's presentation that I found very, very powerful. And there is uh, some interesting similarity between uh, the early Buddhist analysis of experience and what we get in uh, recent uh, scientific research and in cognitive psychology, and I wanted to just read 
two, three extracts. This is from uh, Feldman Barrett's How Emotions Are Made. It's a recent book uh, that has been published only last year and called up a lot of interest because she basically debunks the idea that emotions can be related to particular areas in the brain. Unfortunately, she doesn't step out of that whole paradigm of identifying the mind with the brain, but uh, that can't be helped. But there's a few statements she makes where she just sums up current research on the degree to which our experience, our sensory experience of the world is a construct of the mind. You construct the environment in which you live. It's page 83. You might think about your environment as existing in the outside world, separate from yourself, but that is a myth. 86. Your perceptions are so vivid and immediate that they compel you to believe that you experience the world as it is, when you actually experience a world of your own construction. Much of what you experience as the outside world begins inside your head. And 130. We humans are architects of our own experiences. We do not passively detect physical changes in the world. We actively participate in constructing our experiences, even though we are mostly unaware of that fact. Yeah, I just thought this um, a nice scientific corroboration of the relevance of the idea uh, of a dream. So the point is not to say that things outside don't exist at all, but that we are very much actively involved in constructing our experience of things seen, heard, etc. And that this question, do we actually open our eyes when we awaken from a dream? Are we sure that in leaving the dream world, we are entering a real world are so pertinent uh, for appreciating uh, the situation, how we experience, how we construct it, and how it is useful to question that sense of an actual reality out there in the way I am experiencing it. End of comment. Terms like Buddha, Bodhi, and Sambodhi convey the sense of awakening as well as understanding. Uh, comment, yeah, I just like to underline this also, Bodhi, the translation enlightenment has never been sitting well with me and a number of scholars have pointed out that uh, Buddha and Bodhi, some Bodhi, really the, the central sense is awakening. End of comment. Sometimes in the Dhamma, the emphasis is on the sense of awakening. Here then is a kind of awakening. Expressions like Dhamma Chakku, the Dhamma I, Panya Chakku, Wisdom I, and Chakku Udapadi, the I rose, bespeak of an arising of some sort of an I. We already have eyes, but an I is said to arise. All this goes to show that in the context of Nibbana, where we are concerned with the deeper aspects of the Dhamma, the awakening from a dream is not a true awakening. It is only a passage from one dream world to another. But let us see how the concept of upadi, of assets, goes deeper. What lies before us is the dream of samsara. In order to awaken from this dream, we have to understand somehow the vanity of all assets connected with the dream that is samsara. The fact that this understanding also comes through some illumination we have already explained the other day in our discussion of the pain of joy at the end of the Bhaya Sutta. As we pointed out then, the world of the six sense bases, which the worldlings regard as their world, when examined against the background of that Udana verse, reveals itself to be no more than six narrow beams of light, appearing through a solidly thick curtain, namely the darkness of delusion. We happened to mention the other day that the sun, the moon and the stars shine precisely because of the presence of darkness. In the non-manifestative consciousness, which is infinite and lusts all round, vinyanang anidasanang anantang sabato babang, sun, moon and stars are not manifest because there is absolutely no darkness for them to shine forth. 
even the formless, which is the penumbra of form, disappears in that penetrative lust of wisdom. So the relinquishment of all assets, Nibbana, is not like the other temporary awakenings already mentioned. Those three instances of awakening are of a temporary nature. <coughs> the awakening in the cinema world is extremely short-lived. That film fan, although he became disenchanted with the scenes because of the unexpected sudden illumination of the cinema hall, when it is dark again, influxes of sensuality, existence and ignorance so overwhelm him that he gets engrossed in the cinema world as before. The case of the devalued currency note is also like that. Though the cravings, conceit and views about the devalued note are gone, one still runs after notes that are valid. As for the awakening from a dream, we all know that it is temporary. When again we go to sleep, we have dreams. But the awakening in Ibana is not of such a temporary nature, character. Why? Because all the influxes that lead one into the samsaric slumber with its dreams of recurrent births are made extinct in the light of that perfect knowledge of realization. That is why the term Asavankaya, extinction of influxes, is used in the discourses as an epithet of Nibbana. <coughs> the Arahans accomplish this feat in the concentration on the fruit of Arahanthut, Arata Palasamadhi. Though there are Enough instances of references to this Arata Palasamadhi in the discourses, they are of, very often interpreted differently, as we have already seen in the context of that verse of uplift in the Bhaya Sutta, some discourses alluding to the nature of an Aran's mind have been misinterpreted, so much so that there is a lot of confusion in regard to the concept of Nibbana. As a matter of fact, that concentration peculiar to an Aran is of an extraordinary type. It baffles the worldling's power of understanding. This can well be inferred from the following verse of the Aratana Sutta. Yang Buddha Setanto Parivannayi Suching Samadhing Anantarika Anya Mahu Samadhi Natena Samona Vinjati Idampi Dhamme Aratanang Panitang Etena Sachena Suvatanti Hotun That pure concentration which the supremely awakened one extolled that concentration with the noble ones call immediate. There is no concentration comparable to it. This is the excellent dual nature of the Dhamma by the power of this truth, may there be well being. Common translation by Abhika Bodhi. The purity that the Supreme Buddha praised, which they call concentration without interval. The equal of that concentration does not exist. This too is the sublime gem in the Dhamma. By this truth, may there be safety. Yeah, and I just wanted to add uh, uh, that this qualification as an, an, an antarika is another point uh, to that basically different perspective between early discourses and later commentary tradition, where we get this um, distinction into path and fruit. The actual experience is anantarika as a direct experience, and there's not this uh, separation into <coughs> excuse me a mind moment, a path mind moment, and a fruition mind moment, as we have in later tradition. And instead, the idea of the path refers to the whole period of practice that leads up to that actual experience of breakthrough. End of comment. This incomparable and extraordinary concentration has given rise to many problems concerning the concept of Nibbana. The extraordinariness of this concentration of the Arahant is to some extent connected with the term Anantarika, referred to above. Now let us turn our attention to the significance of this term. The verse says that the concentration of the Arahant is also known as Anantarika. The term Anantarika is suggestive of an extraordinary aspect of the realization of Nibbana. Immediately after the extinction of the defilements through the knowledge of the path of Aranthot, one realizes Nibbana, 
the cessation of existence or the cessation of the six sense bases. As we mentioned earlier, it is as if the results are out as soon as one is written for an examination. One need not wait for the results. Realization is immediate. There is a special term to denote this experience of realization, namely Anya. It is a highly significant term derived from Ajahnati to know fully. Anya is full comprehension. The concentration of the fruit of Arantut is also called Anya Palasamadhi and Anya Vimokha. Anya carries with it a high degree of importance. We come across in the Sutta terminology a number of terms derived from the root Nya to know, namely Sanya, Vijnana, Panya, Jnana, Abhinya, Parinya and Anya. Sanya is perception, Vijnana is radically discriminative knowledge, Panya is distinctive knowledge, Jnana is knowledge as such, Abhinya is specialized knowledge, Parinya is comprehensive knowledge, and Anya is that final knowledge of certitude through realization. The high degree of importance attached to Anya is revealed by the following two verses in the Itivuttakan. Sikas sikamanasa unjumanganu sarinum kayasming patamangyanang tato anya anantara tato anya vimutntas nyanang vihoti tarino akuppa me vimutti di bhava sangyojana kaye to the disciple in higher training as he fares along, training according to the straight path. There arises first the knowledge of extinction, and then immediately the final knowledge of certitude. And to that steadfast such like one, thus released by final knowledge of certitude, there arises the thought, unshakable is my deliverance, upon the destruction of fetters of existence. Comment translation by Ireland. For a learner who is training in conformity with the direct path, the knowledge of distraction arises first, and final knowledge immediately follows. Freed by that final knowledge, by destroying the fetter of being, the serene one has the certainty, unshakable is my release. End of comment. It is evident from these two verses that the realization referred to is in many ways final and complete. In point of fact, these two verses have been presented by the Buddha in this context by way of defining three things relate, relevant to the realization of Nibbana. These three are called faculties, Indriya. They are Ananya Tanya Sasami Indriya, Anyindriya, Anya Tavindriya. The term Anya simplicity, even in the faculty called Ananya Tanya Sami Indriya. An anyata nyasami means I shall know what has not been fully known. This is a definition of what in the verse is referred to as kayasmin patamang nyanang. First, there is the knowledge of extinction. The knowledge of the extinction of the defilements is called an anyata nyasami indriya in this context. The words tattu anya anantara and then immediately the final knowledge of certitude refer to that faculty of final knowledge or aninyarya. The knowledge that prompts the conviction, unshakable is my deliverance, is the knowledge and vision of deliverance, which is defined as anyatavindriya. It refers to one who is endowed, endowed with the final knowledge of certitude. The difference between anyindriya and anyatavindriya is a subtle one. <coughs> For instance, the expression buttavi pavarito, one has finished eating and made a sign of refusal, decisively shows that one has had one's fill. Similarly, it is that anya tavindriya, note the past active participle, which prompts the words unshakable is my deliverance, akupa me vimutti. The knowledge and vision of deliverance is reassuring to that extent. As the above verse from the Ratana Sutta makes it clear, this unique and extraordinary concentration has been extolled by the Buddha in various discourses. But for some reason or other, the commentators have simply glossed over reference to it, though they sometimes expatiate on a particle of mere grammatical interest. Let us now take up for comment a few such discourses. 
In the sections of the 11th Indian Guttara Nikaya, there comes a discourse called Sanda Sutta. There the Buddha gives to the Venerable Sanda a description of a level of concentration characteristic of an excellent thoroughbred of a man. It is a strange type of concentration. One who has that concentration is described as follows. Suniva patavang nisaya jhayati, na apang nisaya jhayati, na techang nisaya jhayati, na vayang nisaya jhayati, na kakasa nanchaya tanang nisaya jhayati, na vinyanan chaya tanang nisaya jhayati, na kinchanyaya tanang nisaya jhayati, na neva sanya na sanyaya tanang nisaya jhayati, na idhalo kang nisaya jhayati, na paralo kang nisaya jhayati. Yampidang, Dittang, Sutang, Mutang, Vinyatang, Pattang, Pariyesitang, Anavicharitang, Manasa, Tangpini Sayana, Jhayati, Jhayati Chapana. Even Jhayang Chapana Sandha, Badrang, Borisa, Janiya, Sainda, Deva, Sabrahmaka, Sapajapatika, Arkavanang, Namasanti. Namote Purisa Janya, Namote Purisuttama. Yasate nabi janama yampi nisaya jhayasi. In this discourse, the Buddha gives as an illustration the musing of a thoroughbred of a horse, which we shall drop for brevity's sake. The musing of an excellent thoroughbred of a man is described as follows. He muses not dependent on earth, water, fire, air the sphere of infinite space, the sphere of infinite consciousness, the sphere of nothingness, the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. He muses not dependent on this world or on the world beyond. Whatever is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, attained, sought after, traversed by the mind, dependent on all that, he muses not, and yet he does muse. Moreover, Sanda, to him thus musing, the devas, with Indra, with Brahma, with Pajapati, even from afar, bow down, saying, Homage to you, O thoroughbred of a man. Homage to you, O most excellent of men. For what it is on which you go on musing, we are at a loss to comprehend. Comment the translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. He does not meditate independence on earth, Independence on water, independence on fire, independence on air, independence on the base of the infinite of space, independence on the base of the infinity of consciousness, independence on the base of nothingness, independence on the base of neither perception nor non-perception, independence on this world, independence on the other world, independence on what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, reached, sought after and examined by the mind, and yet he meditates. When he meditates in such a way, the devas, along with Indra, Brahma and Pajapati, worship the excellent thoroughbred person from afar, saying, Homage to you, O thoroughbred person. Homage to you, O supreme person. We ourselves do not understand what you meditate in dependence on. And here I am giving the uh, Chinese, and it's very closely similar. It speaks of the monastic, the monk who meditates like this, not in dependence on the earth. And then we get all the elements, the four immaterial ones, this world and another world, the sun and the moon, what is seen, heard, experienced, cognized, sought after, etc. And yet he meditates. And then we get the praise here, the homage. And then they say, we are not able to know independence on what you are meditating. End of comment. Though all possible objects of concentration are negated, the Buddha affirms that he does muse. Venerable Sanda, out of curiosity, inquires, but then how, Lord, does that thoroughbred of a man muse? <clears throat> the Buddha explains that while in that state of concentration, the perception of earth in earth for example, is gone for him. Pataviya patavisanya vibhuta hoti. So also in the case of other objects of the senses, such as water, fire, air, down to whatever is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, attained, sought after, and traversed by the mind. The verb vibhuta, repeatedly used in this connection, is however differently interpreted in the commentary. 
It is paraphrased by pakata, which means clearly manifest. This interpretation seems to distort the meaning of the entire passage. It is true that in certain contexts, vibhuta and avibhuta are taken to mean manifest and unmanifest, since vibhava is a word which seems to have undergone some semantic development. However, its primary sense is sufficiently evident in the sutta terminology. For instance, the twin term bhava vibhava stands for existence and non existence. In this context, too, vibhuta seems to have a negative sense rather than the sense of being manifest. Hence our rendering the perception of earth is gone for him. It is obvious enough by the recurrent negative particle in the first part of the sutta, niva patavigni saya jhayati, na apagni saya jhayati, etc., that all those perceptions are negated and not affirmed as manifest. The commentator seems to have missed the true import of the sutta when he interprets vibhuta to mean manifest. If further proof is required, we may quote instances where the word vibhuta is used in the suttas to convey such senses as gone, departed or transcended. In one of the verses we happen to quote earlier from the Kalahavi Vada Sutta, there was the question posed, Kisming vibhuta nabhusanti passa when what is not there do touches not touch. The verse that follows gives the answer, Rupe vibhote na posanti passa, when form is not there, touches do not touch. In this context, too, vibhuta implies absence. A clearer instance comes in the posala manavapucha of the parayana vanga in the sutta dipata, namely the term vibhuta rupa sanyasa, occurring in one of the verses there. The canonical commentary, Chula Nitendesa, which the commentator often draws upon, also paraphrases the term with the word Vigata, Atikanta, Samatikanta, Vitivatta, gone transcended, fully transcended, and superseded. So the word Vibhuta in the passage in question definitely implies the absence of all those perceptions in that concentration. This then is a unique concentration. It has none of the objects which the worldlings usually associate with the level of concentration. We come across a number of instances in the discourses in which the Buddha and some other monks have been interrogated on the nature of this extraordinary concentration. Sometimes even Venerable Ananda is seen to confront the Buddha with a question on this point. In a discourse included in the section of the 11th in the Anguttara Nikaya, Venerable Ananda questions on the possibility of attaining to such a concentration with an air of wonderment. Siyanuko bhante bhikkuno tata rupa samani patilabo yata neva pataling padavi sanyas na apasming apo sanyas na teachasming teacho sanyas na vayasming bayo sanyas na akasa nancha yatane akasa nancha yatana sanyas na vinyanancha yatane vinyanancha yatana sanyas na kinchanya yatane akinchanya yatana sanyas na neva sanya na sanya yatana neva sanya na sanya yatana sanyas na idaloke idaloke sanyas na paraloke paraloka sanyas Yampirang dittang sutang mutang vinyatang patang pariyesitang anavicharitang manasa tatrapina sanyas sanyi chapanas. Could there be lord for a monk such an attainment of concentration when he will not be conscious, literally percipient, of earth in earth, nor of water in water, nor of fire in fire, nor of air in air, nor will he be conscious of the sphere of infinite space in the sphere of infinite space? nor of the sphere of infinite consciousness in the sphere of infinite consciousness, nor of the sphere of nothingness in the sphere of nothingness, nor of the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception in the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception, nor will he be conscious of a this world in this world, nor of a world beyond in a world beyond, whatever is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, attained, sought after, traversed by the mind, even of it he will not be conscious, and yet he will be conscious. <clears throat> Comment translation by Vikam Bodhi.
But uh, could Bhikkhu obtain such a state of concentration that he would not be percipient of earth in relation to earth, of water in relation to water, of fire in relation to fire, of air in relation to air, of the base of the infinity of space in relation to the base of the infinity of space, of the base of the infinity of consciousness in relation to the base of the infinity of consciousness, of the base of nothingness in relation to the base of nothingness, of the base of neither perception nor non-perception in relation to the base of neither perception nor non-perception, of this world in relation to this world, of the other world in relation to the other world, of anything seen, heard, sensed, cognized, reached, sought after and examined by the mind, but it will still be percipient. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, I think uh, these passages with Ananda inquiring uh, up, I would suggest to understand them as being taking place at the time before he had attained stream entry. I think a stream enter, even though not every stream enter may have sufficient samadhi abilities to actually practice such a samadhi, but by dint of having had an experience of Nibbana would know of such an experience and would not need to inquire about the possibility of using this for a concentration practice. So I think this uh, passage are best read from the period between his uh, going forth and his uh, realization of a stream entry, which we have in Samyutta Nikaya, uh, the instruction here was received from Punna Mantani Buddha, uh, uh, where he then states that uh, when I heard this Dhamma teaching, I made the breakthrough to the Dhamma, the teaching on the uh, with a simile of the mirror, that just as one grasps the mirror to see oneself, so it is by grasping, uh, in particular, the five aggregates, that this sense I am occurs. Very powerful teaching that he received and that helped him to realize stream and dream. And I think after that teaching, after that realization, he would not have questioned this question. Or an alternative interpretation could also be that he uh, is asking on behalf of others who were present in the hope of getting the Buddha to expound it, but that he already knew. Anyway, end of comment. <clears throat> Whereas the passage quoted earlier began with Soneva Patavingni Saya Jayati, he muses not dependent on her, and ended with the emphatic assertion Jayati Chapana, and yet he does muse. Here we have a restatement of it in terms of perception, beginning with Neva Pataving Patavi Sanyi and ending with Sanyi Chapana Asan. The Buddha answers in the affirmative, and on being questioned as to how it is possible, he gives the following explanation. Idhananda bhikkhu evang sanyi hoti, etang santang etang panitang yadidang sabbha sankara samato, sabbhu padi padini sango, tanangayo virago nirodho nippanam. Evang koa nanda siyo bhikkhu no tatarupo samadhi padilabho. Here Nananda, a monk, is thus conscious, Evang Sanyi. This is peaceful, this is excellent, namely the stilling of all preparations, the relinquishment of all assets, the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, extinction. It is thus, Ananda, that there could be for a monk such an attainment of concentration. Common translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Here Ananda, a bhikkhu, is percipient thus. This is peaceful, this is sublime, that is, the stilling of all activities, the relinquishment of all acquisitions, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. It is in this way, Ananda, that a bhikkhu could obtain such a state of concentration. End of comment. This, in fact, is the theme of all our sermons. Venerable Ananda, of course, rejoiced in the Buddha's words but approached Venerable Sariputta also and put forward the same question. Venerable Sariputta gave the same answer verbatim. Then Venerable Ananda gave expression to a joyous approbation. Yadidang Anga Padasming. 
Friend, it is wonderful, it is marvelous, that there is perfect conformity between the statements of the teacher and the disciple, to the letter and to the spirit, without any discord on the question of the highest level of attainment. Comment translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. It is astounding and amazing, friend, that the meaning and the phrasing of both teacher and disciple coincide and agree with each other and do not diverge in regard to the foremost, foremost state. End of comment. These last words in particular make it sufficiently clear that this concentration is Arahatta Palasamadhi, the concentration proper to an Arahant. Here then is the experience of Nibbana, extraordinary and unique. Quite a number of discourses touch upon this Samadhi. Let us take up some of the more important references. Venerananda is seen to pose the same question rephrased on yet another occasion. It runs thus. Na pataving manasikareya, na apang manasikareya, na techang manasikareya, na vayang manasikareya. Na akasa lanchayatanang manasikareya, na vinyanan chayatanang manasikareya. Na akinchanya yatanang manasikareya, na neva sanya na sanya yatanang manasikareya. Na hira lokang manasikareya, na para lokang manasikareya. Yampidang ditang, sutang, mutang, vinyatang, patang, parijisitang, anavicharitang manasa. Tangpina manasikareya, manasi chapanakareya. Could there be a lord for among such an attainment of concentration wherein he will not be attending to the eye, nor to form, nor to the ear, nor to sound, nor to the nose, nor to smell, nor to the tongue, nor to taste, <coughs> nor to the body, nor to touch, nor to the earth, nor to water, nor to fire, nor to air? nor to the sphere of infinite space, nor to the sphere of infinite consciousness, nor to the sphere of nothingness, nor to the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception, nor to this world, nor to the world beyond. Whatever is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, attained, sought after, traversed by the mind, even to that he will not be attending, and yet he will be attending. Comment translation by Bikamboli. Bhantan, could a bhikkhu obtain such a state of concentration that he would not attend to the iron forms, the ear and sounds, the nose and odors, the tongue and tastes, the body and tactile objects, that he would not attend to earth, water, fire or air, he would not attend to the base of the infinity of space, the base of the infinity of consciousness, the base of nothingness or the base of neither perception or non-perception. He would not attend to this world, he would not attend to the other world. He would not attend to anything seen, heard, sensed, cognized, reached, sought after and examined by the mind, but he would still be attentive. End of comment. There could be such a concentration, says the Buddha, and Venerananda rejoins with his inquisitive, how Lord could there be? Then the Buddha gives the following explanation, which tallies with the one earlier given. Ida Ananda Bhikkhu Evang Manasikaruti Etang santang, etang panitang, yadidang, sab sankara samatun, sab upadi patinisango, tanhakayo virago nirodo nipanam. Evang koa nanda siya bhikkuna tatarupa samadhi patilabo. Here in Ananda, a monk attends thus. This is peaceful, this is excellent, namely the stilling of all preparations. The relinquishment of all assets, the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, extinction. It is thus, Ananda, that there could be such an attainment of concentration. Comment translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Here, Ananda, a bhikkhu would attend thus. This is peaceful, this is sublime, that is, the stilling of all activities, the relinquishment of all acquisitions, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. It is in this way, Ananda, that a bhikkhu could obtain such a state of concentration. End of comment. <coughs> 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 
In the light of the foregoing discussion, we are now in a position to take up for comment that enigmatic verse of the Kalahavivada Sutta, which in a previous sermon we left unexplained, giving only a slight hint in the form of a simile. Sanya sanyi, navi sanya sanyi, nopia sanyi, navi bhuta sanyi, evang sametasa vibhoti rupam, sanya nidanai papanja sankha. Comment translation by Bikobodhi. Not percipient through perception, not percipient through disturbed perception, not altogether without perception, not percipient of what has vanished. Form vanishes for one who has so attained, for concepts due to proliferation are based on perception. Yeah, we already had this verse in Sermon 11, where I expressed my uh, agreement with Venamanyanananda's interpretation of it as a reference to Nibbana. And there I had also ventured to give a tentative first translation of the Chinese parallel. In preparation for today's lecture, I have uh, sat down and translated the whole discourse into Chinese, from the Chinese. And yeah, the first bad news I have is that the translation by Babat is not really reliable. <clears throat> and this is uh, perhaps not surprising because the Chinese is very, very difficult and cryptic. So the second bad news I have is that my translation is also not reliable. And in fact, I'm not going to give my translation of the whole sutta, but just of that one verse. And the third bad news I have is that the Chinese itself is also not reliable. Yeah, the translator seems to have missed up things at times. So, for example, the reference to sata and asata, uh, what is pleasant and unpleasant, uh, and the translator has misunderstood that to mean sat and asat. So instead of translating it as pleasant and unpleasant, he translated it as is and is not. Yo and wu. So uh, the Chinese is really uh, very difficult. It's one of these very early translations where only a specialist uh, can make sense who is really familiar with the translation terminology of this particular translator and also with the underlying Indic original to detect these type of translation errors. So after three bad news, now one good news, I think I've been able to improve on the translation of the verse in question from what I offered in Sermon 11. So now I understand this to mean not percipient of a perception or a formless perception, nor without perception or with dysfunctional perception. And this has... Uh, help me to get a clearer perspective on this verse and I would like to go into this in some detail. So Venamanyana Ponika in his um, German translation of the Sutta Nipata, he relates Vibhuta Sanyi, the expression Vibhuta Sanyi to Sutta Nipata 1113, Vibhuta Rupa Sanyi, which was actually also mentioned by Venamanyana Nanda earlier. And uh, the other term, Visanyi, I did a quick search and uh, in the Vinaya, this is volume 4, page 109, 109. Uh, the term Visanyi is the result of getting drunken. This is the Saragata story where one monk gets, gets so drunken that he even behaves a little bit in disrespectful towards the Buddha. So he's really out of his senses. And then I found the expression Kitta Chitta Visanyino. This is in Anguttara Nikaya, volume 252. That is the discourse among the force that describes the four Vipalasas. And uh, so when then there's, a, there's a verse at the end that which sums up the teaching on the four Vipalasas. And so when beings are under the influences of these four Sanya Vipalasas and they get into wrong use, their minds are deranged, kitta chitta, and their dis perceptions is disturbed or twisted. And this leads me to the idea of hallucination. And I am proposing, this is just my, uh, my idea and open to any criticism, uh, whether the idea of hallucination would work at least for some instances of the term visanyi, visanya, 
such as hallucinating permanence, etc., when in fact things are the opposite of it. And so with this, um, what Milamanyana Ponika has uh, helped us uh, see uh, for Vibhuta Sanyi, and with my little exploration of Visanyi now, I propose the following correspondences. This Visanya Sanyi corresponds to this dysfunctional kind of perception. And Vibhuta Sanyi understood as Vibhuta Rupa Sanyi is precisely what we get in the Chinese, not form perception, formless perception. And on this um, understanding of the four types of perception described in the Pali and the Chinese, I, we actually come to a kind of tetralemma type of presentation in reply to the question, Katang Sametasa Vibhoti Rupang, Sukang Dukang Vavi Katang Vibhoti. How must one attain for an I supply name and form to vanish? How do pleasure and pain also vanish? <clears throat> I think the previous verse mentioned name and form, Nama Rupa, Namanchi Rupanchi. And my own understanding of the uh, of this part of the Kalavivada Sutta is that because of metrical reasons, Nama Rupa has been abbreviated to just Rupa. And if we keep in mind uh, the exposition in Mahanidana Sutta, according to which there is no possibility to experience Rupa without Nama, then this is abbreviation uh, doesn't really make a major difference from a viewpoint of meaning. Whether we say Rupa or we say Nama Rupa, we are talking basically about the same thing. And so I, my, my suggestion is to, to read Rupa always keeping the name also in mind. So the tetralemma I get, uh, you know, tetralemma is always there. Something is like this. It's the opposite. It's both and it's neither. So the first is the Sanya Sanyi. We have the same in the Chinese, perception, perception. And I understand this to refer to normal types of perception, that is perception that in some way relate to form. And then we get the opposite, perception without form, formlessness. And that is Vibhuta Sanyi, uh, following Venable Jnana Puning, Vibhuta Rupa Sanyi, and which is exactly what we have in the Chinese, not form perception. And then a mixture of both, which is I am proposing, this is just my proposal, hallucination. Visanya Sanyi or the Bu Xing Sheng, the not working perception, it doesn't work, doesn't work properly, doesn't operate properly, the dysfunctional I translated. And so this is uh, something like, I mean, to get this idea of, of form and formlessness combined, like imagine hallucinating uh, things up in the sky and seeing uh, people moving around in the sky, a type of like a mirage or so where the formless and the form are being, in a way, combined or mixed. And then there is the neither form nor formless. That is when one is unconscious, asanyi wuxiang. And it makes, to, to my mind, uh, this, this kind of tetralemma, uh, 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 seeing the underlying tetralemma, uh, makes even stronger the point that I already uh, made uh, in relation to Sermon 11, that the whole trajectory of the Sutta leading up to this point, it must be uh, about, uh, the, the, the verse in question must be about the Nibbana experience. Now, this interpretation by Venerable has been challenged recently, criticized. And here's the criticism, but before I come to that, I should say a few things about the author. This is, oh, I misspelled Bhikkhu, so there should be another K there, sorry. This is another very impressive monk in Sri Lanka. He is, to me, he is the most exemplary kind of forest dweller I have ever come across. He lives in extreme seclusion, and many of us think he's very highly attained. Uh, in the past, there was a time when he would only allow visitors to come three times. And there were three days in the year where visitors were allowed to come to see him. These are the full moons that uh, mark the shift from one of the three seasons to the other. We have uh, three seasons, the winter, summer, and rains. And at all the rest of the time, he would just live by himself in silence. And he was just living out in the forest. 
And for the rainy season, uh, he would accept a kuti, a very, very simple wooden construction, only under the condition that it has only three walls. So that one wall, would, one side of the kuti would just be open and he would still be in complete contact with the forest. And he also doesn't use a mosquito net. In fact, I remember I asked him how he manages and he just looked at me and said, after about three years, you don't feel it anymore. Well, I have uh, not followed that practice and I'm still using a mosquito net. Anyway, this monk also uh, doesn't want his name to be mentioned. So like he very kindly commented on my Satipatthana book and so I just call him Muni Bhikkhu. And uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi calls him Vanaratana Ananda. And he had, uh, has, a, has a very, very good knowledge of the Pali Suttas. He knows much of it from memory. He's very, very good in Pali language and grammar also. And so uh, together with his practical experience, he is really the right person to, 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 to come in and say something, particularly on the Ataka Vagan Parayana Vagana. And he earlier had already made comments on K.R. Norman's translation, and these comments were like handwritten and passed among a few of us who are interested and uh, uh, could benefit from it. And now very recently, they have uh, he has actually offered his translation of Ataka Vaga and Parayana Vaga. It's a book published for free uh, distribution called The Silent Sages of Old. And I am uploading the PDF for all of you to download. It's a very, very useful translation. He's very literal. And I really appreciate his literal translation. Because there is a fashion nowadays to produce translations that sound good because the English is like polished and fluent, but are not necessarily reflecting the Pali original. And these translations that he gives, they are really close to the Pali original. In fact, they help us to understand the Pali better. He really follows it very closely. So this is a highly recommended you know, translation. And now he has a footnote in his translation of Kala Vivada Sutta. On this verse in question, he makes the following comment. Then this has sometimes been taken to refer to the Anupadi says the Nibbana Dhatu, Jnananda concept and reality. This, I think, is a mistake. The next verse refers to Angang Yakasa Sudding, the highest purity of the spirit. This is echoed in the Kosala Sutta, in Anguttara Nikaya 1029, which has Parama Yakavi Sudding, so all Singhari's manuscript. The Burmese and all editions have Paramatta Visuddhing. In this sutta, the highest purity of the spirit is identified as Neva Sanya Na Sanya Yatana. This may well be the meaning also here. Note that all these states have to be overcome and that the Arahant is referred to only in the last verse of the Kalavivara Sutta. So at this point, with all the deep respect that I have for Muni Bhikkhu, uh, I am venturing to disagree. And it is in a way nice for me to get a chance after last uh, sermon I disagreed with Venomanyana and now to get a chance to defend his interpretation. I think that this verse Neva Sanya Na Sanyi, Na Sanya Sanyi, Na Visanya Sanyi, etc. I think that this is a reference to Nibbana. But let me first go for the Yakasa Sudding, as uh, Muni Bhikkhu rightly points out uh, this verse in uh, this passage in Anguttara Nikaya, and here's the passage. Etat agang bhikkavi paramattavi sudding panya pentanang yadidang sabasu akinchanya yatanang samatikkama neva sanyana sanya yatang vasampaja viharati. And uh, actually, uh, I found, as the Venerable mentioned, not only the Salonese manuscripts mentioned in the PTS edition, footnote, but the Siamese edition also as Paramayaka Visuddhin. And the Siamese or Thai edition is often very interesting for important variants it has. And it's something that whenever I compare variants, I find that the, the, the Siamese edition has sometimes quite significant ones. 
And so in the reading Parama Yaka Visuddhing is definitely to be taken seriously. <coughs> Here's the translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi and he follows the Burmese PTS and Silence editions reading Paramatta Visuddhing. Of those who proclaim supreme purification, and this is the foremost, namely by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, one enters and dwells in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And uh, Chinese parallel, Madhyama Agama, this is the foremost among heterodox views, the best among heterodox views, namely completely transcending perceptions of form up to he enters and dwells in the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. And here I'm giving again the Chinese for the two phrases that are uh, uh, important. And so it is clear that in the Chinese there is nothing about yaka. So the Chinese does not support the Siamese edition and the Singhalese manuscript editions. And uh, just a verse here from the Sutta Nipata, where we also get the Yakasa Sudding and where it does not refer to neither perception nor non-perception, but actually to full awakening. This is uh, 478. Sariranchi antimang dhareti patosha samboding anottarang sivang ittavata yakasa suddhi who bears the final body and has attained the bliss of unsurpassed full awakening to that extent is Yakasa Sundi. So what I am saying up to this point is that the uh, idea that Yakasa Sundi uh, relates to neither perception or non-perception is certainly meaningful and it is supported by the Singhalese manuscripts and the Siamese edition but it is not found in other editions, not found in the Chinese, and the Yakasa Sudhi can also uh, stand for awakening. So I think um, the term is intriguing, but we cannot take any definite um, conclusion based on it, and it is not at all found in the Chinese parallel to the Kalavi Vada Sutta. There's no Yakasa Sudhi there at all. So what we are to make of this term is a matter of uh, ambil this is an ambivalent matter. Now, in order to support my contention that Benjamin Yanananda is right with his interpretation of the verse, uh, in Sermon 11, I went uh, in detail through the preceding part. So I just want to summarize it up and point out the basic principle that seems to stand between the trajectory of the Kalagivada Sutta up to the verse on Nasanya Sanyi. And I see it as expressing dependent arising, Paticca Samapada. It starts off with the inquiry after uh, Kalavi Vada and immediately joins this to Parideva Soka, that is the sorrow and, and grief. And Soka Parideva is mentioned together with Dukkha at the end of Paticca Samapada. Soka Parideva Dukkha Domana Supayasa Sambhavanti. Then we get a tracing down to Chanda, and this is, I see it as corresponding to craving. Then Satan and Asatanja, that is feeling. Then Pasa is obviously contact, and Nama Rupa is name and form. So I think if we look at Kalagivada Sutta closely at this sequence it goes through in this question answer format, we actually see it is working its way from the dependent in, in the reverse sequence through the central links of dependent arising. And the next question is about the cessation of form, or I think it should be understood name and form, and the cessation of sukha and dukkha. And this reply to this that we get the verse Nasanya Sanyi. With that trajectory in place, I don't see how this could be receiving a reply from the Buddha uh, with the reference to neither perception or non-perception. Neither perception or non-perception is not the cessation of name and form, is, and it is not a question of how all this dependent arising from Parideva Soka all the way down to name and form can be overcome. So I think if we look at it from what comes before, the interpretation by Venomanyananda gets substantiated. However, there is also the part that comes after it, and this is also why and quite understandable. Uh, uh, 
when, when Muni Bhikkhu uh, sees it as referring to neither perception or non-perception. So let me just read again uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. You explained to us whatever we asked you. Let us not ask something else. Please tell me this. And before I continue reading the translation, I just want to point out that the questioner considers the discussion to be concluded at that point, and the Buddha does not disagree with that. So it again shows that from the viewpoint of the Buddha with his Nasanya Sanya, he has shown when name and form cease, when Sukhantuka cease, and what is the very source of the whole series of conditions leading up to Kalavivana and to quarrels and litigations. I continue with the translation. Do some wise men here say that at this point this is the foremost purity of the spirit, or do they speak of it as different from this? Some wise men here say that at this point, this is the foremost purity of the spirit. But some among them, claiming to be skilled, speak of an attainment without residue remaining. Having known these to be dependent, and having known the dependencies, the Muni, the investigator, having known liberated, does not enter disputes. The wise one does not come upon various states of existence. So, the... As I said, um, reference to the Yakasa Sudhi is doubtful as to its meaning. But let us assume that it means uh, neither perception nor non-perception. Then I think uh, uh, the point would be, and I believe I said that already in Sermon 11, that the question has misunderstood the verse uh, spoken by the Buddha. And so I would see this as similar to the Potapada Sutta. But the Buddha also says something about uh, perception and its cessation, and then immediately the question uh, gets into some: is perception the self, or is it different from the self? I think it's a it's, a, it's an understandable thing that uh, those living in the thought world of that time and not familiar with the concept of nibbana would misunderstand such 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 statements. And so the Buddha repeats that and then uh, adds something else. And that is, un the meaning is uncertain. Uh, and there's the word samayam, which I'm not quite sure how Bhikkhu Bodhi understands it. But uh, Muni Bhikkhu, Venumanyanananda, and also Venumanyanaponika all, all understand it to refer to cessation, to annihilation. And on that understanding, then uh, this Yakasa Suddhi is kind of related to annihilationism. And that would also work very well for neither perception nor non perception. Because in Brahmajala Sutta, uh, it is mentioned as one of the annihilationist views the idea that by attaining neither perception nor non perception, at death, one's Atman one's, uh, will get uh, uh, annihilated by merging in the realm or state of existence, however you like to call it, of neither perception nor non perception. So, on that reading, I think Benabanyananda's interpretation as this being about existence and non existence would get confirmed and that could also be the last line uh, which again is open to interpretation it could be as when Bully takes it the wise one does not come upon various states of existence and this much we could even support from the Chinese because in the Chinese, the questioner simply asks uh, whether uh, somebody who has accomplished what the Buddha had just described is that really an invincible sage. He, he wants to know if somebody who has that realization is really has reached the highest, is, has become liberated. And the Buddha replies that this is certainly the case and, and then describes that uh, he attained the fruit of wisdom practicing concentration in the midst of forest. And the final line is that he has abandoned the world and let go of that or another body. 
and I would understand this to refer to rebirth. This is the way Bhikkhu Bodhi understands the Bhava Bhave. But uh, Bhava Bhave na Samiti Dhiro could alternatively also be understood in the way when Vanyananda takes it that the wise one does not agree to existence or non-existence to these two extreme views in which the question has tried to pour this verse on Nasanya Sanyi, Navi Sanya Sanyi. And it is perhaps even possible that that final uh, line is on purpose ambivalent to catch both meanings. But what I find important is the part that comes before in this last verse. So the need to understand the dependency of these views, whether it is now one or two views, on the Yakasa Sundi. That, that, that pointing to conditionality, and this is really the question I has been asking for conditions all the time, uh, up to that Nevas, uh, Nasanya Sanyi verse. And now he's being told, look at the dependency of that very view you're talking about. And then that a sage, a muni, is born as is a vimangsi, an investigator of that nisaya. What is what is the nisaya? What is the dependency? And this is obviously the self, the idea of a self. And then, as if we're joining the main topic of the whole discourse, that when one has known that nyatva and is liberated vimutto, namivharameti, this is why I gave the Pali, one does not enter disputes. That is the topic. That's where the whole thing started of Kala Vivada. Where do they come from? So basically, my uh, present understanding of this final part, and this is, of course, open to discussion with no claim whatsoever at being the final definite uh, understanding of it, is that the questioner has not understood the Nasanya Sanyi part. And he might have misunderstood it to refer to neither perception nor non-perception, or in some other way construed it as some non-dual experience or whatever. And he refers to that, he expresses that understanding by speaking of it as Yakasa Suddhi, and uh, wants to get that clarified. And in, in, the, in, in reply, the Buddha says, yes, some consider this the Yakasa Suddhi and others don't. And perhaps this is a uh, reference to uh, annihilationism. But then he points the questioner, basically saying to the questioner, you look, you have been asking for conditions all the time. Now you also look at the condition of that very view you are proposing. And see that that view, as well as those who are in contrast to it, is dependent. Both of them are dependent, and the dependency is the self, the self view. And if you are understanding this, you become liberated. And one who is liberated does no longer dispute. That's again pointing back to that very Nibbana reply to the whole Kalavivada series. And then you become a wise one and you don't take any of these two opposing views as well as or you're not going to be subject to rebirth. So in sum, this is my two cents, five cents worth of understanding uh, the way how at present I understand the meaning of the Kala Vivada Sutta and I am quite convinced that the whole series before must be leading up to Nibbana. It has parallels in Sakapanya Sutta. There's also a question answer a series with similar, to, and it has a terminology similarities with the Madhupindika Sutta, the Kalavivada, Pesunya, and particularly the, the, the whole question of uh, the relationship of Asanya to Papancha Sankha that I think whatever we make out of the part that comes after the Nasanya Sanyi part, and there my uh, uh, explanation is open to discussion, I think uh, the part that comes before makes it unmistakably clear that the Venvanyananda is right. This must be a reference to Nibbana, the Nibbanic experience, in the form of the 
And I think in the form of a tetralemma by saying this is not a normal perception, it is not a uh, kind of non-normal perception in the sense of being some sort of a hallucination, it's also not being unconscious, it's also not a formless perception, any of the formless spheres. Anyhow, this much for a rather long comment. I hope it was uh, somewhat helpful and not too confusing what I presented here. And I may be very happy to any comments, clarifications and criticism uh, that you might be able to offer. This is all still like in the process of being uh, reflected on and investigated by myself uh, of this uh, very powerful verse in this very beautiful sutta. Asanya sanye, navi sanya sanye, nupi asanye, navi bhuta sanye, evang samitas vibhuti rupam, sanya nidana e papancha sanka. End of comment. <coughs> The general trend of this verse seems to imply something like this. The worldlings usually believe that one has to have some form of perception or other. But the one referred to in this verse is not percipient with any such perception, na sanya sanyi. As if to forestall the question whether, whether he is then in a swoon, there is the negation na vi sanya sanyi. A possible alternative, like a plane of existence devoid of perception, is also avoided by the emphatic assertion no pia sanyi. Mm -hmm. Yet another possibility, that he has gone beyond perception or rescinded, is rejected as well with the words navi muta sanyi. The third line says that it is to one thus endowed that form ceases to exist, while the last line seems to give an indication as to why it is so. Sanya nidanai papancha sankha, for reckonings born of proliferation have perception as their source. The nature of these reckonings we have already discussed at length. The conclusion here given is that they are rooted in papancha. Now, the passages we have so far quoted are suggestive of such a state of consciousness. Briefly stated, even the emphatic tone characteristic of these discourses is sufficient proof of it. <clears throat> for instance, in the first discourse we took up for discussion, there is the recurrent phrase, not jayati, does not muse, with reference to all the possible objects of the senses. But at the end of it all comes the emphatic assertion, jayati chapana, nevertheless he does muse. Similarly, in the passage dealing with the sanya aspect starts with neva pataving padavisanyi, he is neither conscious, literary, percipient of earth and earth, followed by a long list of negations, only to end up with an emphatic sanyi chapanasa, but nevertheless he is conscious. And so also in the passage which takes up the attending aspect and winds up with the assertion manasi chapanakariya, and yet he will be attending. <coughs> All these evidences are pointed to the fact that we have to interpret the reference to the paradoxical state of consciousness implied by Nasanya Sanyi, Navisanya Sanyi, etc., in the Kala Vivada Sutta, in the light of that unique concentration of the Arat, the Arat Palasamadhi. <coughs> this is obvious enough even if we take into consideration the occurrence of the term Papancha Sankha in the last line of the verse in question. The worldly concepts born of the prolific tendency of the mind are rooted in perception. That is precisely why perception has to be transcended. That is also the reason for emphasis on the need for freedom from the six sense bases and from contact. The abandonment of Papancha Sankha is accomplished at this extraordinary level of concentration. The immense <coughs> excuse me. The immense importance attached to the Arata Palasamadhi comes to light in the passage we have quoted. These discourses are abundant proof of the fact that the Buddha has at all extolled this samadhi in various ways. The verse beginning with Nasanya Sanyi, Nabi Sanya Sanyi, in particular, points to this fact. 
On an early occasion, we give only a clue to its meaning in the form of an allusion to our simile of the cinema. That is to say, while one is watching a film show, if the cinema hall is fully illuminated all of a sudden, one undergoes such an internal transformation that it becomes questionable whether he is still seeing the film show. This is because his perception of the film show has undergone a peculiar change. He is no longer conscious of a film show, nor has he put an end to consciousness. It is a strange paradox. His gaze is actually a vacant gaze. The verse in question expresses such a vacant gaze. When the sixth sense basis of the Aran cease and the lustre of wisdom comes up, giving the conviction that all assets in the world are empty, the vision in the Arahatta Palasamadhi is a vacant, as vacant as that gaze of the man at the cinema. It is neither conscious nor unconscious nor non-conscious nor totally devoid of consciousness. At that level of concentration, even this material form is abundant. The line in the pain of joy in the Baya Sutta, which we came across the other day, Atta Rupa Arupa Cha Zukadukka Pamuchati, and then from form and formless, and from pleasure and pain is he freed, can be better appreciated in the light of the foregoing discussion. With the relinquishment of all assets, even this body and the experience of a form and of a formless, as well as pleasure and pain, cease altogether due to the cessation of contact. That is why Nibbana is called a bliss devoid of feeling, avidaita sukha. Now as to this vacant case, there is much to be said, though one might think that it is not at all worth discussing about. If someone asks us, what is the object of the gaze of one with such a vacant case? What shall we say? The vacant case is, in fact, not established anywhere. Appatittam. It has no existence. Appavattam. And it is objectless. Annarammanam. Even at the mention of these three terms, Appatittam, Appavattam, and Annarammanam, some might recall those highly controversial discourses on Nibbana. Why do we call the vision of the Arahant a vacant case? At the highest point of the development of the three characteristics of impermanence, suffering and not-self, that is, through the three deliverances animitta, appanita and sunyata, the signless, the undirected and the void, the aran is not looking at the object with a penetrative gaze. That is why it is not possible to say what he is looking at. It is a gaze that sees the cessation of the object, a gaze that penetrates the object as it were. When the cinema hall is fully illuminated, the mind of the one with that vacant gaze at the film show doesn't accumulate the stuff that makes up a film. Why? Because all those cinema preparations are now stilled. Cinema assets are relinquished. And the craving and the passion for the cinema film have gone down, at least temporarily, with the result that the cinema film has ceased for him and is extinguished within. That is why he is looking on with a vacant gaze. With this illustration, one can form an idea about the inner transformation that occurs in the Arant. From the very outset, the meditator is concerned with sankaras or preparations. Hence the term sabba sankara samata, the stilling of all preparations, comes first. Instead of the arising aspects of preparations, he attends to the cessation aspects, the furthest limit of which is nibbana. It is for that reason that the term Niruda is directly applied to Nibbana. Come and I just wanted to point out the importance of this for actual insight meditation. It is really a key that we work with preparations and instead of rising attend to the cessation. And the furthest limit of that cessation is Nibbana. End of comment. Simply because we have recapitulated the terms forming the theme of our sermons. Some might think that the formula is such as some form of gross object of the mind. This, in fact, is the root of the misconception prevalent today. It is true that the Buddha declared that the Arant has as his perception, attention and concentration the formula beginning with etang, santang, etang, panitang, etc., but this does not mean that the Arahant in his Samadhi goes on reciting the formula as we do at the beginning of every sermon. 
What it means is that the Arahant reverts to or reattains the realization he has already won through the lust of wisdom, namely the realization of the stilling of all preparations, the relinquishment of all assets, the total abandonment of the five aggregates, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation and extinguishment. That is what one has to understand by the saying that the Arant attends to Nibbana as his object. The object is cessation, Nyaroda. Here is something that Mara cannot grasp, that leaves him utterly clueless. This is why Venerable Nandiya in the Nandiya Tiragata challenges Mara in the following verse. Obasaja tang palla gang chittang yasa bhinna sun tanisang bhikkung asadja Kanha, dukkang nigachasi. The monk whose mind is always bright and gone to the fruit of Aranthut. Should you dare to change that monk, oh blackie, you only come to grief. Common translation by K.R. Norman. Attacking such a bhikkhu whose mind is like splendor, constantly fruitful, you will come to grief. Kanha. End of comment. Kanha Blackie is one of the epithets of Mara. Even gods and Brahmas are unable to find out the object of the Aran's mind when he is in the Pala Samapati, the attainment to the fruit. Mara can never discover it. That is why this attainment is said to leave Mara clueless or deluded. Mara Sitang Pamohanan. All this is due to the uniqueness of this level of concentration. The three deliverances, Animitta, Appanihita and Sunyata, are indeed extraordinary, and the verse Nasanya Sanya refers to this Arata Palasamadi, which is signless, undirected and void. Usually one's vision alights somewhere or picks up some object or other, but here is a range of vision that has no horizon. In general, there is a horizon at the furthest end of our range of vision. Standing by the seaside or in a plain, one gazes upon a horizon where the earth and sky meet. The whirling's range of vision in generally has such a horizon. But the Arahant's range of vision, as here described, has no such horizon. That is why it is called Anantang, endless or infinite. Vinyanang, Anidasanang, Anantang, Sapambatopabang, the non-manifestative consciousness, endless lustres on all sides. That vacant gaze is an endless perception. One who has it cannot be called conscious, sanyi, nor can he be called unconscious, visanyi, in the worldly sense of the term. Nor is he devoid of consciousness, asanyi, nor has he put an end to consciousness, vibhuta sanyi. Let us now take up two verses which shed a flood of light on the foregoing discussion and help illuminate the meaning of canonical passages that might come up later. The two verses are from the Arahanta Bhagavata Dhammapada. Ye sang sannicha yo natanti ye parinyata bhojana sunyato animitto cha vimango ye sang gocharo akase vasakunta nang gadite sang duranaya yasasava parikhina ahare cha nissito sunyato animitto cha vimango ye sang gocharo those who have no accumulations and understood fully the subject of food and whose feeding ground is the void and the signless, their track is hard to trace, like that of birds in the sky. He whose influxes are extinct and is unattached to nutriment, whose range is the deliverance and of the void and the signless, his path is hard to trace like that of birds in the sky. Comment translation by K.R. Norman. Of whom there is no accumulation, who have knowledge of and have renounced food, whose realm is empty and unconditioned release, their going is hard to follow like that of birds in the sky, whose asavas are destroyed and who is not dependent upon food, whose realm is empty and unconditioned release, his track is hard to follow like that of birds in the sky. End of comment. The accumulation here meant is not of material things such as food. It is the accumulation of karma and upadi, assets. 
The comprehension of food could be taken to imply the comprehension of all four nutriments, namely cross material food, contact, will, and consciousness. The feeding ground of such arahants is the void and the signless. Hence their track is hard to trace, like that of birds in the sky. The term gati, which we rendered by track, has been differently interpreted in the commentary. For the commentary, gati is the place where the arahant goes after death, his next born, so to speak. But taken in conjunction with the simile used, gati obviously means the path, padam, taken by the birds in the sky. It is the path they take that cannot be traced, not their destination. Where the birds have gone could perhaps be traced with some difficulty. They may have gone to their nests. It is the path they went by that is referred to as gati in this context. Just as when birds fly through the sky, they do not leave behind any trace of a path. Even so, in this concentration of the Arahant, there is no object or sign of any continuity. The second verse gives almost the same idea. It is in singular and speaks of an Arahant whose influxes are extinct and who is unattached to nutriment. Here, in the simile about the birds in the sky, we find the word Padang, Pa, used instead of Kati, which makes it clear enough that it is not the destiny of the Arahant that is spoken of. The commentary, however, interprets both Kati and Padang as a reference to the Arahant's destiny. There is a tacit assumption of some mysterious Anupadises and Ibana Dhatu. But what we have here is a metaphor of considerable depth. The reference is to that unique Samadhi. The bird's flight through the air symbolizes the flight of the mind. In the case of others, the path taken by the mind can be traced to the object it takes, but not in this case. The key word that highlights the metaphorical meaning of these verses is kocharu. Kochara means pasture. Now in the case of cattle roaming in their pasture, one can trace them by their footsteps, by the path trodden. What about the pasture of the Arahants? Of course, they too consume food to maintain their bodies. But their true pasture is the Arata Palasamadhi. As soon as they get an opportunity, they take to this pasture. Once they are well within this pasture, neither gods, nor brahmas, nor mara can find them. That is why the path taken by the Arahans in the Palasamadi cannot be traced, like the track of birds in the sky. We have yet to discuss the subject of Sa Upadisesa and An Upadisesa Nibban Dhatu, but even at this point some clarity of understanding might emerge. When the Arahan passes away, at the last moment of his lifespan, he brings his mind to this Arata Palasamadi. Then not even Mara can trace him. There is no possibility of a rebirth, and that is the end of all. It is this extinction that is referred to here. This extinction is not something one gets in a world beyond. It is a realization here and now in this world. And the Arahant, by way of blissful dwelling here and now, enjoys in his everyday life the supreme bliss of Nibbana that he had won through the incomparable deliverances of the mind.